In today's project, you are going to be taking a trip back in time, like way back in time, and learning about one of the most amazing and interesting cultures in our world, the culture and the time period of the ancient Egyptians. Um, that's a long time ago, ancient Egyptians. I mean, I know I've seen like this kind of person, but first of all, when, when was ancient Egypt? Between 3000 BC and 30 BC. When was that? About 5,000 years ago. Wow. That's old. Yup. So now we know kind of what time period the artwork that we're going to be learning about comes from 5,000 years ago, even though that's really hard for our minds to comprehend, it's old. So now we need to talk about where is ancient Egypt or was ancient Egypt? Where in the world is Egypt anyway? Here is where we are right now, Indiana. Egypt from us is not in the United States, across the Atlantic Ocean to that large continent right there, which is called Africa. Where in Africa? Right there in the top right hand corner is Egypt. Now, before we get too far into the project of what I'm going to have you do today, Let's take a look at some of the basics of ancient Egyptian artwork, because the ancient Egyptians did a lot of artwork. Take a look. The period of ancient Egyptian art lasted from about 3000 BC to 30 BC, and is generally separated into three kingdoms. The Old Kingdom, the Middle Kingdom, and the New Kingdom. Egyptians created the first ever portraits of individuals. The sizes of different figures was highly symbolic in ancient Egyptian art. Pharaohs, for example, were often the largest figures in any painting, symbolizing their dominance and power. The smallest figures were usually peons, the little people as it were. Egyptians' use of color was also highly suggestive. Men who worked outside were often red, whereas women and indoor workers were painted yellow. Egyptian painting made use of the same mixed perspective found in Stone Age art. This meant that different body parts and objects in the same scene were viewed from different angles to make each feature distinctly recognizable. For example, feet were always drawn in a profile or side view because they would be less recognizable if you looked at them head on. This conveyed more information about subjects than if painters had only used one perspective in their work. In paintings of people, eyes and shoulders were painted in frontal perspective, while faces, waists, and limbs were shown in profile view. The style of ancient Egyptian painting is fairly easy to identify, even if you don't know much about art. One thing that makes it so recognizable is its flatness. There is no horizon or vanishing point, and the forms in Egyptian painting are completely flat. Instead of a two-point perspective, parallel lines called registers were used to order the subjects in a piece. Registers separate scenes and provide a sense of depth. For example, when two figures overlap, the one on top is closer and the one underneath is further away. The absence of a register indicates chaos and occurs in battle and hunting scenes. Did you hear the narrator say that the ancient Egyptians were the first people ever to create portraits of other people? I think that's fascinating. No one ever wanted to draw people before? That's amazing. He also said a couple of other things that I want to make sure that we understand. So let's take a look at a picture and think about some of the things that the narrator said. In this picture, we have two Egyptian people. This picture was probably painted on the wall of a tomb uh, because that's what these paintings were for. They were painted inside burial chambers. And then the picture 
shows what the people who are still alive hope for in the afterlife, for the people who have been buried. Anyway, in this picture, we see two people. One of the things that the narrator said was that in a picture with different objects and different things, some of the things are drawn from different perspectives. For example, these two people have sideways facing feet. This is called profile view. All of the feet of all Egyptian people in paintings are drawn side view. Another thing that's side view is their heads. Now, not everything on their head is in side view, but the nose, the chin, you can see that man's ear, the head is definitely side view. Now, some things on this, these people's bodies are front view. For example, their chest and shoulders. You can see both of the shoulders on these people because their upper body is facing forward. Now, another thing that is facing forward are the people's eyes. Eyes are always front view. Now, there is only one eye, which makes it easy for us to assume that they are looking the correct way, but that is a frontwards facing eye. This is a frontwards facing eye because it is drawn like this. We can see the whole eye. We can see both of the corners of the eye. We can see the entire iris and the eyebrow. If it was a sideways facing eye, it would look like this, and it doesn't. In fact, the eye, the forward facing eye, became such an important symbol in Egyptian culture. It even has a name. It's called an ujat or an eye of Horus, and it has a specific meaning. The meaning for this symbol is protection, royal power, and good health. You see the eye of Horus in a lot of Egyptian artworks. Now, are you ready to get on to the artwork? You are going to be drawing an ancient Egyptian style portrait or a picture of a person. A portrait meaning though just the head portion, not the whole body. And you're also going to be drawing your own cartouche. We'll talk about what a cartouche means later. But first let's talk about the supplies that you will be needing. Since you are at home, you are going to be using things that you can find at home. Obviously, we're going to need a sheet of paper. Now, this piece of paper, which is what I'm going to use, is just a blank piece of paper that I took from my printer. So if your family has a printer and it has paper in it, just grab a piece of that. If you don't have a printer or you don't have any paper in it, there are other things that you can use. This is a receipt that I got in the mail. It's got writing on one side, but the other side is clean. I can totally use that. So think about things that come in the mail. This was a, something I took from the printer. It's already got print on one side, but not on the back. I could totally use that. So you might look in your trash and find something. And this is a piece of homework that my son brought home. It's graded. He doesn't need it anymore. Perfectly good white side on the back. So you might look in your book bag or in your home desk or under your bed for some old homework that you can use the back side. And of course, if you have to, you can always use a piece of notebook paper. Notebook paper has lines on it, but that's okay. If that's all you have, that that is totally acceptable. Now for the first part of our project, you're just going to need a pencil. Later on, we'll need some tracing and some coloring supplies, but we'll discuss that later. Pencil, probably an eraser, Looks like I need to go find one. Gather up your supplies and meet me right back here. All right, you've got your paper. This is going to go horizontal. So when you're setting up your area, make sure that paper is going side to side. Another thing that you will need is this picture. Now, you won't have yours printed out like I do. Yours will be on your computer. It's in that file that is that was in the email where you got this video from. You'll just bring that up on your computer screen when you need to look at it. This is just for looking at because the first thing that we're going to draw is we're going to draw the shape of a side view head. We're gonna add the eyes, the nose, the mouth, maybe an ear, we'll talk about that later, and that big, neck thing, that necklace thing. That's all we're gonna draw at first. Let's get busy. Okay, so here I have my paper horizontal, my pencil is ready. The first thing that we have to do is we have to draw this or something similar to that right here. We're not gonna draw anything right here yet because like I said before, 
We're going to draw something called a cartouche in that space later on. Now, this picture um, is not for tracing. I don't want anyone to trace off of their computer screen. This won't work anyway, because one of the things we're going to add to our picture is a crown. And there are many different Egyptian style crowns. So that means I have to draw smaller on here so that I can fit a big headdress thing up on top of that person's head. So rule one, draw on one side. Rule two, leave room up here for a crown of some kind. So that means I'm going to start the top of my head probably about here. He's no hair yet. Round forehead, nose. This is a profile view so we can see the shape of the nose. The lips. I'm going to just go ahead and draw the lips kind of like this. Chin. Okay, and neck. Now the back of the head, which is probably going to get covered up with my crown, so I'm not going to worry too much about if I make it wrong because I know I'll probably be covering it up later anyway. So back of the neck, and then there's the beginning of our necklace. We've got shoulders. My person is going to go off this paper somewhat. That's okay. And the big round thing and then the rest of his arm. I can't fit the rest of what I see on here, but that's okay, because the important thing that we're gonna be drawing is here and the face, oh, I forgot the eye. Go ahead and add your forwards facing eye. So ellipse, we know that word. Eyeball, eyebrow make it a shape so I can color it in later. And then I'm going to skip the ear for now because I don't know if I will need an ear. It depends on what type of crown I draw up there. When you're satisfied with your drawing, watch the next step. Remember, since this is a video, you can press pause whenever you need to. So I drew that really fast. You may be still back clear on the forehead. Pause, catch up, Press play, pause, catch up, rewind, whatever you need to do to get this done at your own pace. Now, once you have the profile view of the head and the shoulders done, now it's ready to start thinking about what's going to go up there. Now, in the email where you got this video, I gave you some links to a couple of different pages on a website. One of the links is about different types of Egyptian crowns, and one of the links is to different Egyptian gods. Let's take a look at those. Here is where the link about ancient Egyptian crowns takes you. And if you scroll through this, you can see some different drawings of some different types of crowns. So for example, this white and gray thing with a gold ball on it is called the Atef crown. And this caption tells you that this is Osiris uh, wearing the ATEF crown. I don't know what the ATEF crown is, but look, it tells you if you are interested in that, you can read information about the ATEF crown. Here is one called the White Crown. It looks like it has a little snake at the forehead. There's in the information about the that crown. There's one called the Red Crown. You can see that their shapes are different and how they fit on the head. There's the double crown and the blue crown. That one's kind of cool. Also, the royal Uraeus crown. Oh, that's really cool too. That reminds me of King Tut. And the royal vulture crown. Ooh, that's interesting. It has an entire vulture sitting on top of the head. The hem hem, that one's complex. The hem hem crown. Those of you who enjoy a challenge, maybe you will draw this type of crown on your person's head. So I want you to scroll through those. Take a look at those crowns. Do a little bit of research. Read the little the writing that is below the crowns and see which one of those crowns interests you. What do you want to draw on your person's head? Now, you can get a little creative. If you wanted to combine a couple of those crowns and kind of make up your own crown, that would be fabulous. But wait, maybe you don't want a crown. 
Another choice is to make the person on your picture into a god. So let's visit that other link about the gods. All right, here's the link about the ancient Egyptian gods. Now, like the other link, this one allows you to scroll down and it tells you the name of the god and what the god looked like. So this is the god Anubis. Now, instead of a crown, he has an entirely different head because these gods were gods in the afterlife and so they weren't actually human. So they had, most of their uh, ancient Egyptian gods had the head of a different kind of creature. Down here is the information that you might like to see about why Anubis has the head of a jackal. What kind of god was he? What, what did he do? This is Apis, the god of strength. He has a bull for a head. Bastet, the god of joy, is often depicted as a cat head or a lion. Horus, remember we talked about the eye of Horus, although Horus doesn't even have an eye. He's a falcon, so his eye is a little bit different. He has not only the head of a falcon, but you'll notice he is also wearing one of those crowns that we talked about. Kunum, god of creation. This is a ram. Seth, the god of chaos. Hmm. And he is, I don't know what kind of creature. It says right here he is depicted as a strange composite creature. Composite means a mixture of different things. Interesting. Sobek, the god of the Nile. Crocodile. Thoth, the god of wisdom. He's depicted as an ibis, which is a type of bird. Scroll through that list of gods. Take a moment and become interested. Just why does the god have a crocodile head? What's that supposed to mean? Research the things that, uh, that your attention is drawn to. And then if you decide that you would rather draw this person as a god instead of with a crown, then you may do that. Unfortunately, that means you'll have to erase what's here and draw a new head or flip it over and redraw. Um, just look at those pictures that are on the link and you can draw what you see, but do not trace your computer screen. Teachers know when people cheat and that's what it is. It's cheating and I would be very disappointed in people who are tracing. Plus, it's really, really bad for your computer screen when you do that, when you press on it and it, yeah, don't do that. So here's what you're gonna do now. You're going to pick your crown or your god's head or combine them together. That would be cool. Very creative. You've got time. And you are going to draw the rest of this picture. You draw what you want to draw. I'm going to show you what I choose to draw, and I'm just going to guide you along and, and allow you to see my thought process. But you do not have to draw the same thing as me. I'm just taking you along for the ride. Let's go. So now I have decided that I am going to make this type of crown. I am not going to make my person into a god. I'm going to stick with this crown, which is the royal uraeus or sacred serpent crown. And my now, now my job is to just look at what I see on the screen and do my best to replicate it here on my paper. Now, many people say, I can't draw. You're just looking at things that you already know. Lines, vertical line, horizontal line, shapes, things that are thick, things that are skinny, and you are just going to do your best. So I am going to actually start by making the ear on this person because I can see the ear in my picture, and that's going to help me get started on that little green portion because it starts right by the ear. So ear first. Actually, I'm going to go ahead since I have this part and I see that that part of the mask or I'm, um, that part of the headdress comes straight down. I'm just going to do the ear and the crown together.
Now, when the headdress is done, you can add some other details. I'm going to add that long kind of skinny part that they wear on the makeup of their eye. I'm also going to add some designs on this necklace. This is actually called a pectoral um, or a collar. And I can use this picture to guide me or I can just make up my own designs. There. Now my portrait drawing is complete. Now, before we move on to learning about a cartouche, let's talk about coloring this side. All right, now for adding some color to this picture, if we were at school, you know that I would have you outline it probably with some sort of Sharpie first. Now, if you're lucky enough to have Sharpies at your house, which some of you might, that's an ideal choice. Black, perfect. I would probably have us, since this is not a very big drawing, use a skinny Sharpie. But I'm not sure how many of you would have a skinny Sharpie at home. If you do, great. Use it. Um, but you know what you might have is just some sort of black ink pen. This is a felt tip pen, which means that it writes kind of like a super skinny black marker. That would be perfect. Or if you have a set of markers at home that are skinny like this, then you can just dig out your black one or another dark color, like this blue would be fine, and do your outlining with that. I think, since this is kind of a smallish drawing, that you should use a smallish tracing tool. You can decide what that is based on anything that you have at your house. Now, if you're thinking, I don't have any markers and really don't have anything, then you can just totally do this with an ink pen. Here's a regular ink pen. Just outline it with something that's a little bit darker than pencil. Um, and then we'll talk about the coloring step. So I'm going to use this Sharpie. You're just going to find something similar in size and do your outlining. Something, it doesn't even have to be black. It can be a dark color of some kind. Let's trace. All right. I just finished up my tracing with my marker and I'll bet you know what I'm going to say next. Once you trace it, you must then erase it. So now spend a few moments erasing all your pencil marks that you didn't cover up with that marker. Go ahead, meet you back here. All right, when your erasing is complete and you have something that looks similar to this, now it's time to add color. Now remember, we're still gonna make something here later, but we're gonna finish our, per our portrait that we have created first. Um, for coloring this, you're in charge. You decide how you're going to color this. First of all, you may use the website that I sent you to to guide you in your coloring if you want it to be an accurate representation. You can see where it's blue, where it's gold, whatever. Or you can be creative and you can make up your own color scheme for this. I don't care, creativity is good. What are you going to use to color with? That's your choice. You have to use what you have at your house. So, um, I rounded up a handful of markers. I don't have a whole set of anything around here, but I do have some markers. Um, I have skinny markers here, but I also have some other colors that are in thick markers. These have a fine tip. You guys know how to color inside the lines with particular tools. I trust you. You could also uh, use colored pencils for this. Colored pencils are nice and small, so they would work well on a smaller design like this. Um, any kind of colored coloring pencil that you have is fine. I also have crayons. You probably have crayons around somewhere. Um, crayons are totally acceptable as well. It's up to you. So you're in charge of the coloring. So you just get to have a fun time now coloring and being creative. I want you to think about some things though. I want you to think about shading. All fifth graders have done a lot of shading this year, so I know you know how to do it. Where can you have shading on your portrait, um, on the skin, on the headdress, somewhere? 
uh, shading might look cool on part of my little serpent that I have. Shading is going to work well with colored pencils. I can also do shading with crayons. I can also do shading with regular pencils. So you may be sitting there thinking, well, I don't have any coloring tools. I don't have crayons or colored pencils or markers. Then just use a pencil. You and I both know that a pencil can make a lot of different values between white and medium and dark and all of those different shades in between. That's what we were working on before we got sent home from school. So you could do this entire thing just with pencil if you don't have anything else. So take a few moments, color, 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 be creative, and most importantly, have fun with this and be neat. Okay, so I'm just putting the finishing touches on my color portrait. I'm going to talk to you about a few of the things that I did just to show you that you literally can color this any way you want with any tools that you want. I use, ended up using all of my tools. So in, I began with the snake and down here in the green, I started with marker and then I kind of blended it sort of up into crayon. This part is crayon. The headdress, that, that blue is marker, but I don't know if you can tell, I added some shading with colored pencil over the marker. That gold is actually, I found a gold colored pencil. So that gold is all colored pencil with shading. Uh, the face is crayon because I had a, the perfect color of crayon for that. Um, and then the pectoral or the necklace collar is a combination. I just used my Sharpie there. The red is marker. The green is crayon. That blue is marker, and I added some detail with my Sharpie over the top of it when I was done, and I finished up with some crayon. So you can color this. You're in charge of the coloring steps. Do it however you want. But I ask that you do a good job and be creative where you can, whether it's by adding some detail or adding some shading. Now, let's talk about what's going here. And I told you before, and I use this weird word called cartouche. What is a cartouche? Um, what is a cartouche? A cartouche is an Egyptian name tag. A name tag for what? A name tag for your coffin. <laughs> Gosh, why do Egyptians need name tags on their coffins? Ew! Okay, so now you know. A cartouche is a design that together creates your name. And so this side of our paper is where we are going to draw our cartouche. Now, you probably know this already, but ancient Egyptians did not speak English. They did not have letters for writing. They did all of their writing through little pictures called hieroglyphics. And so you guessed it, you are going to create your cartouche with your name on it by writing it in Egyptian hieroglyphics. There is a link that I sent you uh, in your email. You will open it up and you will see some hieroglyphics and you'll also see what a cartouche looks like. Let's take a look. When you open the hieroglyphics link, it'll come up with this first. This is showing you some hieroglyphics. I'm going to scroll clear down to the bottom, past the hieroglyphics, which we'll come back and discuss in a moment, down, down, down to the bottom, where it says, design a cartouche. I'm going to click on this so that you can see what a cartouche looks like. The cartouche is going to be very easy to draw. Basically, it consists of three parts. The first part is a big, tall oval, and it's a frame. It's empty on the inside. That's where you will be designing your name. It's an oval inside an oval so that it creates a frame. Down at the bottom is just a hot dog. That's a piece of wood or a piece of stone that is a stand. And these two pieces are joined in the middle with a piece of rope or a binding of some kind that makes it appear that they are attached together like this. Now this image shows that you can create a design around the outside if you want to, but I'm not going to make that a requirement. 
Now that you know the basic building blocks of what a, what a cartouche will look like, let's take a look at some actual cartouches. Here you can see a cartouche that is painted on. The background is actually part of King Tut's burial coffin. Here you see one that is carved into some sort of sandstone. You can see the big oval. You can see the base and the little image of rope kind of tying the top and the bottom together. And here's another. Inside all of these, you can see those little pictures. But let's talk about what those little pictures mean. Now I'm going to scroll down, and I think down here I will find, ah yes, I'm back to the hieroglyphics. Hieroglyphics are little pictures that stand for words, or in this case, sounds. So if I'm going to make my name tag, my name starts with K, Katie, K. Um, I, at first glance, I think that I have to draw the red shape and the blue shape to stand for the sound of the letter K. But that is not true, don't get tricked. When I click on this, it's going to take me through to an explanation. There's J, there's K. It says there are two hieroglyphs for the letter K. The top image is a basket. The bottom is a hillside. Either hieroglyph can be used for the K sound in words like king and key and in names like Kevin and Catherine. Choose the one that creates the best design in your word. All right, so I can choose either the red shape that's a basket or I can choose the green shape for the hillside. I do not choose both. So if I'm thinking about my name, KT, then KA, the letter A, is next. So I'm gonna back out, and I'm gonna visit the letter A. Now this one is a little bit different. I have two symbols, a bird and an arm. But when I read, I discover something important. There are two hieroglyphs for the letter A. They represent the different sounds of the letter. The vulture, right here, the bird shape, is used for the ah sound in words like around, about, and Adam. So the ah sound. My name is not Katy, it is Katie. So I will not be using the vulture. Let's see what it says about the arm. The arm is used for the A sound in words like say, sail, sail, and names like Amy. So that's the long A. So that's what I will need. A, K, T. So I will need the arm. Um, T, K, A, T, K, T. So I'm going to back out and find the T. T, easy. It looks like I only have one choice on this one. S, T. The bread loaf, well, I'm glad to know what that is. It's used for the T sound. So I only have one choice. That'll be easy. And then my last letter is a Y, K-A-T-Y, but it doesn't make a Y sound. It sounds the E. So let's see what we have here. There are two hieroglyphs for the letter Y. They represent the different sounds of the letter. The single read, that would be that guy by himself, is used for the short Y sound like Y, Yes, and Year, and names like Y, Yasmin. The double read, which means I'm drawing both of those together, is for the long Y sound in words like many, money, and names like Yvonne and KD. So that is what I will be making for my Y sound. All right, let's draw a cartouche. Hold on, I almost forgot to mention. If you scroll down to the bottom of the alphabet, you will see some symbols that stand for blended sounds. You can find a symbol that stands for ch for the ph sound f the sh sound sh and the th sound th so if you have those tricky sounds in your name scroll down to the bottom of the alphabet 
and I bet you find something that will help you. So, using this portion of my paper that I have left, I'm going to first draw the shape of the cartouche. You can go back to your computer, you can go back to the link to look at the picture if you need to. The important thing is that I want to fill this space. I don't want to have a tiny little cartouche. I'd never be able to fit in all the hieroglyphics. So I want this to be nice and big. Especially if you have a long name, you're going to need more space. All right, once you have finished your sketch for your cartouche, now it's time to write your name in hieroglyphics. Get to the hieroglyphics page. Remember, you have to tap under each letter so that you can figure out which of those symbols you're supposed to draw. I've already gone through my name, but your name's not Katie. So you figure out yours and take a few minutes and draw on those pictures. All right, here I have my cartouche, K -K -T, Katie, and there it is. It's all in pencil right now. So I guess you probably know what's next. I'm going to get out my tracing tools. We're going to trace everything, and then I'm going to color it in. And again, you know what you have available to you. So as long as it is traced, erased, colored in neatly and creatively, I don't care what you do. Go ahead, take a few minutes. Be creative, have some fun, and I'll see you back here in a second. Okay, so I have completed my cartouche side. So remember what I told you, what I expect from you is things to be outlined. You can decide what you outline it with. I chose black marker. It needs to be erased, erase the pencil marks after you outline it, of course, and then it needs to be colored in, including the background, as you can see right there. Now, what you color with, how you color these things is up to you. I just want you to be creative and keep it neat and tidy. This is going in your Art Sonia gallery when you're done, um, but just make it complete. Now, it could be done. Yours might be finished right now. I feel like mine has a little extra awkward emptiness up here on that part of my background. And so I'm going to have to figure out what to do there because I just feel like it's not quite complete yet. And so I know where to look though. I'm going to choose an Egyptian symbol, a really popular and common Egyptian symbol that is meaningful to me. And I'm going to put it right there. If you have a lot of extra space, you could do this with a couple of different symbols. We're going to go back to that link, the link that had the hieroglyphics in it, because at the bottom, underneath the hieroglyphics, there's some symbols there. Let's take a look. So I'm scrolling down to the bottom of my hieroglyphics page, and after those blended sounds, there they are. There's a symbol right here called an onk. There's a link to some pictorial things. That's the necklace things. Down here is a symbol picture called a scarab. That's a particular kind of beetle. And then there's that ujat eye that I showed you before. In fact, that's the one that I want to put on my picture. So if I click on any of these things, it'll take me to some information and it will tell me what each one of these symbols means. The ujat eye also known as the Eye of Horus, was thought to have magical powers. It was believed to have the ability to protect and heal. So there you go. That's why I'm putting it on my paper, because I am tired of this injured toe, and I am so ready for it to be healed. So I'm going to use this picture right here to guide my drawing, and I'm going to draw that in that extra empty area of my paper. All right, there. Now, I think that successfully filled my awkward little area, my little extra space. I wanted it to be pretty simple, so I didn't add a ton of color to it. I kept it kind of blue because I have a lot of blue here because it is, after all, just part of the background. 
Now, there is one last thing that I need you to do before we can call this completely done. And that is, it has to do with that white paper background. This looks great. My space is filled. I tucked up into my little empty space. But I feel like there needs to be something to kind of join it all together. Now, I'm going to say color the background. But don't freak out because even I don't want to color this whole background. But what I am going to do is I'm going to choose kind of a, a color that is kind of the color of sand or, or old paper or something just kind of old because it needs to symbolize the ancientness of this culture project that we're doing. And I'm not going to color the entire background, but I'm going to smudge and smear and kind of add some texture just in the large white spaces. Let me show you what I mean. This really should not take very long. For this, I have chosen crayon because I want it to be pale and light and I want it to go fast. So I have some colors like tan, burnt orange, and I even have a copper color. And this is gonna be very simple and very quick. In my large white areas like this, I'm just going to go in at an angle and I'm just going to do some areas. I guess it's kind of like shading. I can change colors. I can change directions. I can crisscross and overlap. It needs to be very faint, very pale. It's basically just giving the background a slight bit of texture and a little bit of filler for those empty white spaces. This should really be something that you don't even notice until after you've already looked at the picture. All right, and literally, that's it. It makes it look like the background has a little bit of texture to it, a little bit of oldness. Perhaps it's like a parchment or a papyrus or a scroll or something. You get the idea. The most important part of that background coloring step is that it be light and faint, barely noticeable. If you don't like how this looks on mine or if you don't think that you can do it successfully, then you can just skip that step. That's all right. Now, the very last thing you're going to do, because this is finished, is you are going to get a good photograph of this picture. Remember I showed you on my last email on March 26th, tips for taking a good photograph. You might need to go get that email back out if you don't remember how to take a good photograph. Use photo booth, make sure it's lined up nice and straight. Make sure you have good lighting, not too much lighting, not too much darkness. Snap a good picture and then send that to me in an email. Soon as I receive it, I will put it into your Artsonia gallery and I will put you on my done list. I hope you enjoyed this project. I can't wait to see what you've come up with.